Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. This is part four of our kinetics discussion. Um, we're picking up here with section 14.5 of the chapter dealing with temperature and rate. Now, if you recall from discussions day one, generally as temperature increases, so does the reaction rate. Now, one of the things we established that I said you should be comfortable with and know for AP is that for each 10 degree increase, the reaction rate approximately doubles. So remember, Celsius, Kelvin, doesn't matter. A change in temperature Celsius is equal to a change in temperature of Kelvin. So temperature has a big impact on our overall reaction rate. So changing 20 degrees, the reaction rate would be quadruple the original reaction rate. Remember, every 10 degrees, it doubles again. So double, quadruple, 8 times, 16 times, and so on. And the reason is because K is actually affected by temperature. K is temperature dependent. In fact, temperature is the only thing that has effect on the K for the reactions that we're looking at. Yes, if you had a different reaction, you would have a different K value. But for a reaction that we're looking at, temperature is really the only thing that's going to have effect on the overall value of K. And that's something we're going to look at at the end mathematically. Now, just as a general reminder here, I want to pick up some things on collision model. A uh, collision model is something you got into pre-AP last year. Now, in a chemical reaction, bonds are broken and new bonds are formed. That's what a chemical reaction involves. Molecules can only react if they collide with each other. So the reacting species have to be at the same place at the same time. Furthermore, molecules must collide with the correct orientation and with enough energy to cause bond breakage and formation. So it's not enough just to collide. You have to collide with the right orientation and with enough energy. So an important note for APFRQs, three key ideas here. One, effective collisions. Effective collisions occur when substances collide in the proper orientation and with enough energy to cause a reaction. So the reactions are a result of effective collisions, and effective collisions are the result of having the right orientation with enough energy to cause a reaction. Those three things need to be put together. If you're talking about why reaction rates are increasing or decreasing, um, in many problems, it's really getting to the fundamental idea behind collision theory. And really, what we're looking at here is not as much increasing and decreasing as just whether a reaction happens in the first place at all. If you're talking about why a reaction occurs, it's because the uh, collisions were effective because they had the proper orientation with enough energy. Now, in terms of energy, the key idea really here is of, of activation energy. And you should recall activation energy from pre-AP chemistry. There's a minimum amount of energy that's needed for the reaction to occur, because you just have to break those bonds. If you don't have enough energy to break the bonds, the reaction's not going to occur. And the symbol for energy of activation is capital E sub A. So just as a ball cannot get over a hill if it does not roll up the hill with enough energy, doesn't have enough kinetic energy to crest the top, it's going to roll right back down. A reaction cannot occur unless the molecules su uh, possess sufficient energy to get over the energy of activation barrier. To understand this idea, it's helpful to visualize what's known as a reaction coordinate diagram. The reaction coordinate diagram we're looking at here is the one for the arrange, rearrangement of methyl isonitrile. So you have CH3NC, and that's becoming CH3CN. It's a fairly simple situation where you're taking the triple bonds, or I should say the triple bonded N to C, and flipping them in the course of this reaction. Now, the diagram shows the energy of the reactants, which is right here. That's an important idea. And the energy of the products, which are right here. Now, remember, the difference between reactants and products would be your change in energy or your enthalpy change of a reaction. So the distance right here is an important difference in terms of thermochemistry, thermodynamics. So those are energy amounts we've looked at before in chemistry. What's new to this chapter is the rest of what you're looking at here. What happens in between those two things? Well, the high point in this diagram is known as the transition state. And at the transition state, you're basically at the point where you could go back to the reactants or you could go on to the products. It just depends on what's happening with, en en with energy. If you collide with enough energy, you can form the activated complex. It's a unstable, larger molecule uh, that is either going to go back to the old substances or move forward and make the new thing. And it really depends upon what's going to happen in that next collision. So when you collide with enough energy, you form the activated complex. 
and the activated complex exists for typically only a very, very short period of time. That next collision between the activated complex and any other molecule is really going to kick it one direction or the other. If it supplies enough energy, then the unstable species will break bonds and you'll end up forming the new bond. So at that point, you're really in the in-between state. Now, which bonds are broken determines whether it slides back to reform your reactants, collisions were all for nothing, or it slides forwards to create your products. And remember that high point in the diagram is really what's called our transition state. So transition state is the place at which the activated complex exists. Over here, we have our reactants. That's where the reactants exist. Here is where the products. That's where the products exist. And up here is our transition state, and that's where the activated complex exists. Now, the energy gap between the reactants and the activated complex, not the reactants and products, are delta E, between the reactants and the top of our hill is known as the energy of activation. It's an, the energy barrier we have to overcome to have a successful collision. Now, fundamentally, and anything in your notes underlined means know this. The larger the energy of activation, the smaller the value of K, and the slower the rate of the reaction. So energy of activation is really related to our constant K, our uh, reaction rate constant. And if you have small k values, when you multiply out the rate equation, you're going to get smaller values for the rate. So small k's mean slower rates of reaction. So large energies of activations would give you small k's, which would give you a slow rate a relationship you must know for this chapter. Now, the next thing we're going to look at, because we're talking about energy and temperature and collisions and kinetic energy and so forth, they're all part of this discussion. We look at a familiar diagram, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that we've talked about in several chapters before this. Remember, they all look fundamentally the same. There's a couple of different ways in general to represent them, but you're going to see two hills, and one's going to be high and one's going to be low. And remember, the high hill is not the high temperature. Temperature, remember, is defined as the measure of average kinetic energy of the molecules in a sample. Within a sample, you've got some high speed, some low speed, and then you have around your average speed where most of your molecules are at. And that would represent basically your average kinetic energy. So you've got some high, some low, and a bunch somewhere in the middle around your average. And temperature is really a measure of that average kinetic energy. At any temperature, there's really going to be a wide distribution of kinetic energies, and that's what the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is looking at. Now, towards the top of the hill, that's around where your average is going to be. But notice the average will be shifted slightly to the right. We talked about this earlier because of the greater of the lengthening at the tail end of this distribution. But that's not what we're getting into here. That was in previous chapters. What we're looking at here is how that relates to the minimum energy needed for a reaction, the energy of activation. As the temperature increases, remember the curve flattens and broadens, so the higher temperature one is the one with the lower height on the hill. Remember the height of this hill has nothing to do with energy of activation per se, because high energy diagram hills mean high energy of activations. Here we're looking at something different. This is not energy of activation. Energy of activation is right over here. And remember, that's not changing for a reaction, but the average kinetic energy of the particles is. In the higher temp situation, it flattens out and broadens because the area under the curve is constant between the two. And therefore, at our energy of activation, at a high temperature, we've got a larger population of molecules with enough energy to break away. So as we increase the temperature, we end up with a larger and larger and larger group of molecules with enough en kinetic energy to meet the energy of activation needs and cause a reaction to occur. Now you'll notice this is an increase in temperature and it's really not a great increase in temperature but you'll notice the area under the curve, under the red curve, is significantly higher than the area under the curve, the blue curve. This would be approximately what a 10 degrees difference would look like because you can see that we've got twice the number of particles with enough kinetic energy in the red situation here. So if the dotted line represents our activation energy, then as the temperature increases, so does the fraction of the molecules that can overcome the energy of activation barrier. As a result, the reaction rates are going to increase. Now, 
one of the things that Maxwell and Boltzmann were looking at was the distribution of these molecules under give different conditions. And this is the equation they developed. This is not one you have to know for the AP test. It's just the starting point for an equation we're going to look at in a second here. The fraction of the molecules can be found through this expression where R is the gas constant. And since we're talking energy here, you need to use the R value, the energy R value. That's the 8.31 with um, joules in it. And T is the absolute temperature, the Kelvin temperature. E sub A, obviously, is the energy of activation. And remember, E, that's the inverse of the natural log. So it's E to the negative EA over RT. And that's going to equal the fraction of the particles at that specific energy, which is related to a specific temperature. So when the Kelvin temperature doubles, the value of K more than doubles and that's because F more than doubles in that last situation. And that's why the relationship between K and T is not linear. It's exponential. If one doubling causes the other to double, that would be a nice, simple double-double situation that would be a linear relationship. But it's not linear. It increases at a faster and faster rate. So it's an exponential situation. And that means logs and natural logs coming back very, very soon. Now, the person who was studying this and gave us a way to look at these um, energy situations was a man by the name Arrhenius. Now, Arrhenius should sound familiar because he's the acid guy. Yes, it's the same one. The person who came up with our simple definition of acids and bases was Arrhenius. Arrhenius was also looking at this particular situation. And he developed an equation that is really the meat of what you're going to be doing today. So this is really the highlight. Non-conceptual mathematical application is dealing with what's known as the Arrhenius equation. So he developed a mathematical relationship between the rate constant and the energy of activation. Yes, those two things are related to each other. Remember, R is the value that includes joules. Now, A is our frequency factor. It's the number um, that really represents the likelihood that collisions will occur with the proper orientation for the reaction. And the frequency factor is actually an abbreviation of a couple of other things that we lump together um, for one overall constant here. So A represents what's called our frequency factor. Now, taking the natural log of both sides of that equation, you develop this equation. The ln of k equals the negative e sub a over r times the inverse temperature plus the ln of a. This type of equation should look familiar since we talked about it so much yesterday. And notice off to our left, that is a linear relationship. Well, if this is an equation of a linear relationship, we should be able to look at it in its y, plus, y equals mx plus b form. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. And that's really what Arrhenius equation is all about. You know you're going to be using the Arrhenius equation when you are given k data and you are given temperature data. From k and temperature data, we can find energy of activation. So that's an application of this. So when you had concentrations and initial rates, that was differentiated rate law. When you had, in the integrated rate law, concentrations and time, we knew we were going with integrated rate law, looking for linear. If you have k values and temperatures, you are going to be using the Arrhenius equation pretty much every single time. And the Arrhenius equation in this form is given on the AP constant sheet. So obviously, this is something they want you to be able to use. And remember, what you have here is a graphing relationship. If we can plot the natural log of k versus inverse temperature, that's our y and x, inverse temperature. Remember, t was always on the x-axis. Well, this is a different t. It's an inverse temperature at a time, but still going to be on that x-axis. So the natural log of k versus the inverse temperature is a linear relationship. And the slope of that line would equal negative e sub a over r. And b our y-intercept actually is related to the value of k. So we can actually use this to look at that frequency constant as well. So here's a typical Arrhenius problem. The following table shows the rate constants for the rearrangement of methyl isonitrile, same one we looked at before, at various temperatures. Notice, temperature k data means we're going to be looking at Arrhenius equation to do things. So from this data, we want to calculate the activation energy for the reaction. Now, since E sub A is found from the slope 
of the graph of ln of k versus the inverse of the Kelvin temperature, we must set up a plot between these two things. So notice I took the data as it existed up here, and I rearranged it. I've got the ln of k right here, and I have the inverse of the Kelvin temperature there. And remember, ln of k, y-axis, x-axis has to be the inverse Kelvin temperature. Now, once I've generated that line, I can get the slope of that line and the y-intercept of that line to calculate various things. In this case, I'm looking for the slope to get the energy of activation. So the slope of this graph, if I do this in my graphing calculator or if I do this in Excel and it returns the equation for the line, the slope of that line ends up being negative 1.9 times 10 to the fourth Kelvin. Now remember, the relationship was the slope equals negative E sub A over R, so that would mean E sub, B, e sub A would equal the negative slope times R. And remember, you have to use the right value of R, the one with energy in it, the 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Now in this particular case, since we were looking for the energy in kilojoules, notice we ended up converting joules to kilojoules. In the 8.31 value, it's joules per mole Kelvin, so be careful. If it asks for it in kilojoules or your number differs, look to see if it differs by 1,000. It may be just a joule-kilojoule difference. So that would be our energy of activation. And that finishes up the notes over energy, or I should say temperature and rate constant, and energy of activation. So tomorrow we'll finish up the chapter. Have a good night.